Yeah, okay, so uh, I wanted to start uh, with uh, a question asked by Alex about entropy. So just uh, yeah. discuss that a little bit. So uh, how, maybe it's different from the common description that only a increase in randomness. How is it that uh, Roger Penrose? So, the, the best picture to illustrate it seems to me the whole phase space we have here on this picture, for example. So, uh, Penrose thinks in terms of the phase space, and here we have a phase space for, like, for the whole of the universe, and every point in that phase space corresponds to some configuration of the universe. And he also has another um, definition called coarse graining, uh, basically just like box division of the phase space. So you, you see a lot of different boxes. And the biggest box here is what is called thermal equilibrium box. So it's kind of the biggest one uh, to which everything flows uh, to. So by thinking about the phase space and that coarse gradient, every box corresponds to some kind of undistinguishable, on some level, macro state of a system. So basically any two points uh, in that box at the bottom, they will not be distinguishable uh, for the observer. And it's in the same way in the thermal equilibrium, any kind of points here, they are the same in terms of the macro state. So the second law uh, of thermodynamics just said, says to us that when time moves, goes on, uh, the point, our configuration, our universe goes from smaller boxes to bigger ones. And it's always a true. So it means that box will grow with time and that the whole process of growing boxes actually is the same as growing entropy. So entropy uh, is just a measure of that box, uh, which in the Boltzmann case is just a logarithm of the volume of that box in the phase space, which of course uh, is not in reality uh, just a two-dimensional phase space. It could be uh, like many dimensional or even infinite dimensional, maybe. So that's uh, like the basic picture. But the whole idea is, seems to me really clear here. So you can think about the entropy as the measure of the volumes of, that, of, that, of, of those boxes. Yeah, and if you want to connect the usual uh, definition in terms of probabilities, then you can think about those uh, as probabilities of the universe to be in some state. So the bigger box is, the bigger probability of the universe to be in that state. And you can see that thermal equilibrium, equilibrium box is like, for example, 90% uh, of the whole volume. And therefore, there is a really big probability of universe to be in the thermal equilibrium state. But the smaller the box is, the smaller is probability. So in terms of probability, the box grows is the same as the growth of the probability uh, there. So like we move from uh, a less probable state to the more probable state. And that's what, what is meant by the entropy growth actually. And eventually the heat death of the universe. Yeah, yeah. So, and actually, I'm thinking about that like thermal death of the universe uh, in the same way as I'm thinking about the liquids. So, if you take like a glass of water and put some uh, some kind of paint in in there or ink, it dissolves, right? So, like the planets, ga galactic stars. Uh, 
are the same ink uh, inside the universe. So universe just tries to dissolve us. <laughs> and it seems it won't just smooth us out and create that emptiness soup, uh, like regular soup, uh, which is uh, represented by that big box here. Because there is no resistance in that direction. Yeah, yeah, so... I hope that answers your question. Maybe you have more questions connected to yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it does answer some of it, yeah. Okay, okay. So, uh, Joe, before you connected, I've been talking about uh, a book called Little Book of Cosmology. I have shared that into the chapter 27 channel. Uh, and I've been recommended, recommending it as an additional material uh, because it kind of gives a, a little better picture uh, about the Big Bang and the universe uh, scales as the whole. So, like, uh, I haven't been preparing anything uh, in terms of that book, uh, I mean, to show to you today. Um, but maybe I can share, for example, uh, like the whole picture as I think about the universe today. Uh, so like we, we have like what is called like a Milky Way galaxy, right? And Milky Way galaxy looks something like this. So we have like a big disc and kind of like a spherical stuff here. So, and a lot of gas stars there, maybe with a black hole, right? At the center, big su supermassive black hole. Uh, and Earth is kind of like there, out, like closer to periphery, probably not to the center. So Earth is located here, and that's our galaxy. And our galaxy, in terms of the size, is like 100 thousands of the light years. So uh, pretty big uh, in, in, in a diameter. But it also situated in a big cube which is called a uh, local group of the galaxies, uh, a local cluster, uh, pro probably just local group. So, and it looks like a big cube with the uh, side of six millions of the light years. Uh, and inside that cube, we have like two main galaxies. One is Milky Way, and another one is Andromeda. And also 48 more smaller ones, like situated somewhere inside that big cube. Uh, but it's only like 50 of those there, 50 galaxies and that's it, uh, of different sizes. Um, but uh, like the biggest one are just Milky Way and Andromeda, where we have, uh, it seems like 100 uh, billions of stars inside the galaxy. So it's that's pretty big number. <laughs> like one 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 billion is like in terms of MMDMs, for example, or some small candies, uh, it's like a cube with a side of six meters uh, alone, uh, totally filled with like a small ca candies like MMDMs. So it's like one billion. And we have 100 of those in terms of stars uh, inside one galaxy. Yeah, so mostly that cube is like a, an empty space with a bunch of dust thrown into it. And any way you move inside the universe, uh, universe looks kind of the same. So even if you move really far away, uh, it, 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 it in, in terms uh, of the same time. So if you freeze in the time, uh, like right now, and time is not flowing, and you move only in space, the universe is kind of similar, uniform, and it will have like near 50 uh, galaxies in the same cubes. Uh, and that's why Friedman models looks like a dust solution, uh, like to the equation, uh, Einstein e equations. And that's why we think could think about the uh, the universe as a dust thrown into the emptiness of space. Uh, on a much bigger um, extent, we can move to, to like more greater distances. Um, 
by looking at what what is called like Hubble deep field uh, deep field photo. I can demonstrate it right now, but you can Google for it. Uh, basically, it's like um, a photo which been taken by a telescope on the orbit for like three hours or so, uh, and it was directed into the like really small patch of the night sky, which was kind of black, uh, and size of it was like one fifty of the full moon. So only one one fiftieth of the full moon. Uh, yeah, and it contains a lot of galaxies. So after photographing it and creating a shot, they obtain a shot where a lot of galaxies are visible. Uh, some of those are really primordial one, like uh, 13 billion years old. Uh, and by estimating number of galaxies in terms like of 10,000 per uh, that size of the night sky, assuming that the universe is uniform, you can form, uh, like calculate or estimate uh, the number of galaxies in the current visible universe to us. And it's like also 100 billions. So we have like 100 billions galaxies galaxies with 100 billion stars in each that's kind of the whole accounting <laughs> of the galaxy matter uh, right, right now of course you need to to reconsider um, like the time issues and how the light flies through space and also how space is expanding etc uh, but that's like the big big really big story anyway um yeah so we know that like the um uh, further we look um uh, the more we move to the past right so we can see like a galaxies from 300 billion years ago uh on some shots uh and also uh, we see like cmb right cosmic microwave background which comes uh, from every part of space uh, and actually the question about CMB from my sister uh, was the motivation to read more about the cosmology this week so she asked me why CMB isn't some kind of like flash flashlight uh, light uh, like why do not we have any kind of like uh, or, or, or of source of CMB or like what is source of CMB so and like will CMB end or not uh, so those were my like the, the main questions to me uh, and what I understood from the book so actually CMB was kind of like a phase transition um, radiation event so before CMB uh, as we know from, from the previous chapter, we've been discussing it, uh, there is a decoupling time. Let me find it. So we had that decoupling event here, like Penrose tells us that it was like 300,000 uh, years after the Big Bang, but actually currently uh, in the modern books, uh, that number is a little bit uh, bigger like four uh, hundred thousands of years but anyway so and that decoupling phase uh, was as Penrose says so like prior to decoupling uh, the universe would have been basically radiation dominated and after decoupling matter dominated uh, but what it means it means that like prior to the de decoupling we had plasma like uh, state of the universe where everything was filled up with uh, like light and matter, but matter could not be formed. So we had plasma before, and inside plasma we had those like electrons, protons, and photons scattering from each other, really high temperature, and uh, we needed some time, those like thousands of years, for plasma to be cooled down, so the matter could form up. And plasma was like... Uh, a fog-like structure 
so everything was foggy uh, and you kind of cannot see uh, too far away and that's why uh, usually it is told that uh, the universe wasn't uh, transparent uh, at, at that time so and like after 400,000 years uh, plasma period ended and instead of instead of the fog like universe uh, the first like helium and hydrogen atoms was formed the matter formed uh, and even prior to that the dark matter clusters formed uh, but anyway so the actual uh, stuff that happened was like a phase transition uh, where matter was formed for the first time in the universe and plasma states were kind of dissolved so the photons was free up uh, everywhere uh, along the whole universe and they was free to travel across the universe and now I have an answer that like the CMB was radiated by the whole universe at the same instant. Of course, from the current perspective of the Earth, uh, we have something like that, like a circular shell from which the CMB comes to us, something like that. But anyway, like it will come like uh, um, from everywhere and it will come kind of forever. But there is a little uh, note here that uh, it will be redshifted cosmologically so much that it will not be detectable in the future. Uh, I don't remember the uh, like real estimates of that, but in the future CMB will not be detect detectable because it will cool down too much. So they will, it will have like too long uh, wavelengths to be detected or something. Uh, yeah, 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 I read that on Wikipedia, and the originator of the idea is Krauss. I don't remember the name, Richard Krauss or something. Uh, Lawrence? Oh, yeah, 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 seems Lawrence, yeah, yeah. So, anyway, uh, that answers uh, the question, like, uh, how CMB light differs from the light from, for example, a distant star or a galaxy. So galaxy is like a flashlight, right? Or supernova. Uh, it kind of flashes out, sends the photons to us, and they travel long distances, uh, for example, like billions of light years to us, uh, right? But CMB is different because it was radiated from everywhere. And the whole universe was the source for the cosmic uh, microwave background. And that's the main difference uh, in terms of like the flashes of those photons. You know, I, I think that uh, there's um, another aspect, or I think these actually could be in agreement. Um, the angular scale of an object decreases as it gets farther until some point in which it actually begins to increase again. And the reason for this is because like, uh, so say you take a very small, you know, one fiftieth of the full moon, you, you look at the sky. Um, it, when you look through your telescope, if you're looking like far enough away, then you're looking at a time where like the angular size of the sky um, was actually like, you know, much smaller sort of thing. When you're looking out there super far away, you're looking at a much bigger portion, angular portion of the sky, than you're actually like dialing in on your telescope because of the expansion. So um, uh, <clears throat> if you go back to, oh, one sec. If you... If you go back to your drawing of the flashlight, um, I think the flashlight gets, gets wider in time. So, like as, as you as you go like super far away, see how these uh, these rays are kind of diverging. I think mm -hmm. as uh, as the time goes by, for an observer on Earth, it looks like those things are more parallel than divergent. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And, and because of that, the angular scale of your flashlight gets much larger. 
Um, and so there's like, what's interesting is that the curve kind of, uh, there's an inflection point where the angular scale is decreasing up until some distance away, but because now anything past this distance is from an earlier stage in, in the universe that the angular scale actually begins to increase because of how dense the universe was at that time. So I, I think these are like coincident descriptions. Like, you mean that we can describe CMB in that way also? Yeah, like you, you look out to a small portion of the CMB and it, it, it actually shows you like quite a large portion of the sky. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also on this point about the, um, about the cube for the galaxy, just to, just to talk about the density and stuff. There's also the, uh, when you look super far, the, um, high redshift galaxies, mm -hmm. there's media between the two that is so, uh, sparse where I think the density like in between these high redshift galaxies is like one hydrogen atom per cubic centimeter. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so it's a much smaller scale than the galactic scale. Like I, I see the, I see the dust idea when looking at like within a galaxy, but if you look at high redshift galaxies, the medium between them is incredibly sparse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like in in the book, uh, the little uh, book of cosmology, there is what is called like the whole sub chapter about what is called uh, cosmological cosmological structure. Like it it seems like two point four or something. I don't remember exactly, but it's somewhere near. So in this inside the second chapter, there is a whole section about cosmological structure formation. And it's about like the whole uh, story of those galaxies forming uh, and why do we have uh, those like more dense uh, parts of the universe, like galaxies uh, in there. And it seems that it's connected with uh, dark matter distribution uh, along the universe, actually. Um, something like that. So... Yeah, and like b before talking about that, you should understand like the uh, whole uh, constituents of the universe. So you kind of have uh, like four of those. It seems. Uh, let me recall it. Like it, it's like usual matter, like just matter. There should be also dark matter, and also like dark energy which is cor like correspond to our cosmological constant and like space expansion and the fourth one is radiation probably right don't remember yeah i think that's right and then but it's a it's a much smaller fraction so yeah yeah of course the, the uh, radiation yeah really yeah. yeah 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 so we have like uh, 70 persons here. I don't remember the right uh, numbers, but it's like 20 for dark matter, 70 for dark energy, like maybe nine for matter and like one person to, for radiation or something. Yeah, I think that's right. And I, I have no idea how they estimate the actual matter versus energy when, when talking about the dark sector. Uh, you mean like, so so they they kind of use MC squared formula just to uh, measure everything in terms of like energy or something. Uh, yeah, but, but, but why not do it for all of it? Hmm? I mean, like, how how do they draw the line where it's like this is twenty percent matter and seventy percent energy? Yeah, it's only like observed matter. I mean, there's a lot of objects that are hard to see that are inferred yeah it, you can't infer all of them. it seems that they 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 can kind of estimate those uh, 
like for example dark matter comes from the uh, like supernova explosions it seems and also galaxy formation uh, process uh, like i don't remember exactly of course but it kind of like uh, for, for example there are like two galaxies uh, which like crossed uh, together between them and it's they they call it like a bullet cluster or bullet galaxy i don't remember exactly something like bullet so there is a photo of those uh inside the book and uh, like they ca calculated the whole process of like uh two galaxies intersection and calculated the masses in there uh, of the like estimated visible matter inside and they uh, kind of calculated that that the whole matter mass isn't enough to see such a picture and to see such a gravitational lensing of the background stars or something so there should be more matter there and they said like okay we do not see that matter so it's kind of dark and there should be like uh, uh, not not 20 percent of course but like in the whole uh, uh, picture like uh, more matter than the uh, usual radiation and matter and actually radiation comes from the that phase transition from plasma to cmb uh, you may recall that uh, there is what is called like photon uh, to baryon ratio uh, and it seems that's how they kind of estimate also like how much is radiation in uh, to, 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 to the matter uh, in terms of like ratios and it's like 10 to power of 8 or 9 I don't remember exactly photons per baryon um, yeah so this is yeah this this is a great um, perspective uh, it, it's that the energy would be more uniformly distributed throughout the universe and that the the matter is, is what we would expect to cause gravitational lensing and so to explain the effect of the gra gravitation the to explain like the order of magnitude of gra gravitational lensing we can estimate this separation between dark matter and dark energy yes yeah, so and actually, like what was also interesting, uh, what I have discovered in the in the book, that actually during the history of the universe, like different parts uh, of that pi uh, were dominant. So, like basically at the beginning, uh, it was like plasma dominance, radiation dominance, or something, and afterwards there was a matter dominance also, but. So, sorry, I, I just don't remember exactly. But anyway, like uh, the whole cosmological structure was formed like uh, by freezing out the pattern of the dark matter in the universe. And afterwards, uh, that dark matter pattern also uh, kind of attracted matter and something. So, and, and like matter was dominant in, in the universe uh the first like i don't remember like eight billion years or so and only for the last five or four we have uh like dark energy dominance and it it will dominate uh, it will dominate further also so even further we are expecting that sector to grow and other to shrink so like space will expand even more and more and more and more and maybe we will not see uh, some galaxies in the future or stars because they will become like unreachable for us Be because like space can grow even with bigger than the light speed so uh, th there is uh, no paradox in that because uh, like there is nothing to travel there uh, so nothing is traveling like faster than light but the space can grow faster than light it seems uh, at least that's what the book says and it means that the light from distant galaxies uh, in the future will not be able to reach us well it's already like this with the observable universe but it will be even more like this in the future 
Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Like, that's but, exactly what the Observer Universe is. It's the light that is, has reached us. Or the generation. Yeah, actually, we have seen uh, that stuff in the conformal diagrams in the book in the previous chapter. So, where we have a singularity here, like a Big Bang one. So what we have here, we have that particle horizon, and that particle horizon uh, is our observable universe boundary, actually. So here we can see uh, only a part of the universe or something. So it's because it was foggy because of the plasma fire. Is this where particles were formed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but anyway, I need I, I, I need to <laughs> to read a little bit more. Uh, so I'm not really uh, like profound in that stuff. Yeah. Uh, also, can I ask? I, I didn't quite. I, I, this dark matter thing is seems to be well. It could be a fudge factor to account for the uh, higher the observed. Uh, extra gravity that we see that is not accounted for. Mm -hmm. But dark energy, yeah, I... So that, that's only to account for the expansion, the increasing expansion rate of the universe. I, I'm not sure, you, you mentioned something about photons and variants there. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I follow that, if that had to do with the dark energy. Yeah, or, like phot sure the phot photon to baryon ratio or ratio is it seems it doesn't connect it in any way with the dark energy. Okay. So I've been talking about that more like in terms of matter and radiation estimates. So like the radiation is kind of those proto uh, photons, like old photons from the CMB or something. So. And that number is actually used by Penrose to estimate the entropy of the universe um, at the beginning, like after the decoupling, actually. So you can see here uh, in the end of the chapter 27 that uh, he says that uh, in the observable universe, we have like 10 to power of 80 baryons. And because of that, because of that, uh, and because of the uh, photon to baryon ratio, 10 to power of 8, we can estimate uh, the entropy of the universe after the decoupling as the 10 to power of 88. So uh, basically, it seems that he kind of assigns like one bit of entropy to a photon and just multiply uh, photon by the number of baryons to obtain the uh, overall number of photons in the universe. So it kind of just 10 to the power of 88. And it was the entropy of the universe after the decoupling. And afterwards, uh, he also estimates the number of entropy inside the black hole uh, per baryon. And he also multiplies it by the number of baryons. It's like 10 to power of 21. So he obtains the current entropy of the universe as like 10 to the power of 101. And afterwards, by using Hawking Bekenstein formula, he also obtains 10 to the power 123, because uh, you will obtain like 10 to, to the power of um, 43 uh, as the final entropy of the black holes in the final singularity when all of the uh, 10 to the power of uh, 80 baryons will be involved into big uh, black hole agglomeration, big singularity. Uh, so at the end, we will have like maximum entropy estimated by that number. And by using those three numbers, he estimates how specific the universe uh, was at the beginning and uh, is specific now. So basically, like. Uh, he estimates the volumes of those boxes in the state space called B, N, and E. So B is like Big Bang, uh, N is now, and E is like the whole entropy of the universe at the end. So he, he just uh, uses that ratio here and shows that 
actually like b and m like it's like one only one part in that big denominator here and they are really small numbers so i just like written here is that for example if you have one, like one million and you will uh, deduce like 100,000 from it you'll have almost the same number like uh, 900,000 okay and it that uh, like 10 to power of 5 will not change 10 of power of 6 uh, too much and therefore it's the same thing happening here but on on the larger scales so those numbers are actually really small uh, if you measure them in terms of the denominator and therefore uh, we have a really special universe right now and even more special universe we had at the beginning of times that's what Penrose is trying to say by that ratio here that we had a really really small box here and we even now we have really really small box in the state space in terms of like macro um, macro states and he says that actually we do not have a theory which describes why uh, the universe was in so special state uh, at the beginning and in inflation that doesn't answer that as we will see today Yeah, so that's that's kind of it uh, about the previous chapter uh, and a little bit more about cosmology. Maybe you have anything to add or maybe some questions. Yeah, maybe I can ask you, 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 you mentioned that something explained the proportion between dark matter and dark energy. Mm -hmm. uh, could you expand maybe on the part about dark energy or how you inferred that about dark energy. I don't know. Maybe that's oh. Well, um, I, I was just, uh, I think I just put it together from what, uh, what Slava had said and that yeah. for gravitational lensing, you can, you can estimate the amount of mass that's required for a particular lens effect. Right. And so that's how they're estimating the matter content. And then I think they're, they're doing just a net calculation at scale using the inflation or using the expansion of the universe to get the, uh, dark energy content. And they just find that it like totally dominates of all the other things. Um, so is that what you mean? Like, uh, I think, yeah, it is, I think so. I think it is also related to this, uh, photon to baryon ratio. Like you want to know, how much energy there is just kind of uh, yeah uh, throughout the system and and then you take the ratio to how that energy is distributed in terms of mass energy uh, so the photon to baryon ratio is, is some proxy to that right um, and then um, for dark matter you can do the same right you'd say well what is the energy content that's required to cause this cosmological constant and then you divide it by the mass required to get the lensing effects that we see. Yeah, we, we just say, oh, we're missing, we're still missing a lot of energy after the dark matter. So that we don't need to, because it all has that, so that's kind of the... Right. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I mean, there was, there was one other point, um, I mean, it, I think this goes into speculation territory, but I'll have to check out that book that Slava posted. Uh, Which there was is one other yeah, point. There is anyway, so. Yeah, there was, there was one other point about how at certain times there was more matter content. It was, it was dominant as matter and stuff like that. When I hear that and I think about particle physics, there's got to be some way that that matter was converted into dark matter or interacted with dark matter. And so... If if, uh, if at one point matter was dominant and now dark matter takes up a bigger portion than matter, yeah, there's got to be some set of interactions that actually joins the two that will convert matter into dark matter or something like that. So that's that's where my mind goes when I hear that the distribution has kind of inverted 
<laughs> that's, that's, that's that's really interesting. interesting. So, so you're saying that there wasn't space for dark matter early on? Well, I'm just basing it off of what, what Slava had mentioned about how the, the distribution had kind of inverted. Previously, it was dominated by matter, or at, at some point it was dominated by matter, and now we see it's dominated by the dark sector. So there's got to be some some flow yeah. between the two. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah, that's extremely interesting. Yeah, well, also in, in book, they're talking also in terms uh, of the volumes, like cubic centimeters and like amount of matter, for example, for a cubic centimeter, like five protons. Uh, and actually, that's interesting stuff because like uh, the whole formation of the universe and the existence of galaxies and etc., uh, like matter-like structures, are really dependent of the amount on, on the amount of the matter present uh, in in terms of density in in the universe. So, uh, and the good amount is like five protons, it seems. Or I don't also like remember the actual number. Sorry, one moment. It seems like five protons or so per cub cubic centimeter. But like if it was bigger, uh, then everything would uh, just uh, be dragged into the singularity. So nothing will form uh, what we see today. And if it was less, then either way it w would not be formed uh, because like the amount of matter would, would, wouldn't be enough or so. Uh, like I, I don't recall the exact explanation to to the other side, but but anyway, so it's interesting that you you should have like some kind of definite boundaries on the densities uh, of the real matter there, and actually like uh, the whole gravitational clamping happens because of gravitational instability. Uh, so like we have some kind of uh, like in symmetry breaking, some kind of like unstable situation where you have a blob, your system is on the top and it, it falls down somewhere. So in case of gravity, if you have some like a bunch of marbles and they spaced out evenly and one marble is a little bit uh, like to the right here, then it will clump with that marble and that bigger clumped marble will gravitationally pull other mar marbles. So it happens like that, like uh, I've heard because of quantum fluctuations is several, several times is the reason for this not. I haven't heard anything about quantum mechanics yet in, in the book about cosmology. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and act actually about like the dark energy, uh, they're talking that currently it's uh, dominated uh, over any other source of energy and matter. Uh, and it will dominate even more because of the acceleration it has currently. And that uh, it just means that like, if you have like five protons per cubic centimeter currently, then the space will become bigger and you'll have less density here. So it's kind of the space itself, which I grows. Understand. Dominate more. We're not creating new energy here, right? You... It be the same proportion in the universe. No. Yes, yes, but it's it's the vacuum who, which grows, and that vacuum has energy. So that's that's interesting stuff, and it's it's yeah. it's hard to explain because you kind of you cannot explain what actually space is. So mathematically, it's just a coordinate system or something, or like a manifold. Uh, yeah, but but still, physicists do not know what space is and what vacuum is. It's still like an unanswerable un question. Well, we have quantum foam in the back. Yeah, yeah, but Probably. that's not an answer for a cosmologist, yeah. it seems. Be because in the in the book, he says that, like, uh, I I've taken that information from a book. So he, he says that still those answers should be answered nicely and that quantum foam seems like doesn't give you any kind of uh, answers in terms of like on the bigger scale. Yeah. 